Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Ruin Snow, and today we're going to do Let's Talk Legendary. And we're going to be talking about Abishin, the legendary Cephalid. So Abishin, he was actually the ruler of the Cephalid Empire that dominated the ocean depths around the continents of Oteria and Dominera. This occurred after the Phyrexian invasion. To start, just to let you know, Abishan was a Cephalid, and they were not high on the chain for a species in the ocean at the time. This changed, of course, when Laquetus and Abishan made a pact to Ursup the royal Merfolk, who were a family that were in charge, as a result, taking their magical powers as well. Abishan also married the Empress Lawan in order to have a military alliance. After some time, Abishan became suspicious of his wife and became increasingly paranoid. Because of this, she was actually exiled away to another part of the empire and became more of a threat when people began to leave him to be with her. Because of the pact he Abishan had made actually trusted Laquatus, who was actually at this point an ambassador and due to the very increasing paranoia, he wanted to pursue the artifact Myria. And Myria was actually an artifact with unimaginable power. It could tap into the wielder's desires and make them real with a very good chance that a disaster or something would happen to them as a consequence of all these wishes, which would most likely turn out to be death. Abishan wanted the mermen to root all the conspirators after doing all this stuff. Of course, since he trusted the course, he took advantage of the situation and killed all the rival courtiers with false evidence. And by now, with the increasing paranoid even at its worst, Abishan withdrew from public life and rarely left his bedchamber. After some time, he got tired of being in the bedchamber all that time, so he decided to visit the royal treasury. While searching at the royal treasury, he found an artifact that changed him into an air-breathing form, and eventually he found the artifact, Myria, that could grant him the power to secure his empire. He looked into the orb, and it showed him a world made of entirely water. The vision started to become reality, and a great wave started to sweep and flood a third of Ortero's continent. The spell had started getting out of control, and Abishan started to shift from his guild and non-guild form. This also started to cause destruction throughout the entire palace, and Laquatus was able to find Abishan with the artifact and wanted it for himself. As the artifact was slowly destroying Abishan, he was still able to call the guards to stop Laquatus from acquiring the artifact, but at that point, Abishan was fully consumed by the artifact. Miria, and that was the end of him. So there is one card that Abishan is represented, as you can see and you've been seeing throughout the video, is Abishan Cephalid Emperor. It costs six mana to bring out that Cephalid legend. It says, tap and untap Cephalid you control, tap target permanent. Three blue mana, tap all creatures without flying. No one can fight the tide forever. Great saying. So there's only one card Abishan is actually associated with, as you can see, it's Abishan's Desire for one blue mana. Enchanted Creature has Flying, Threshold Enchanted Creature can't be the target of spells or abilities. That's a really cool card, I really like the picture, that's a very good picture of him representing him. So there are only two cards that Abishan is quoted or referred to, and as the first one you can see is Deluge, and it says, From the sea came all life, and to the sea it will return. The sooner, the better, Emperor Abishan. I just really like the saying in the card, especially for his desire for the world being full of water. And the last card that he's quoted in is Fervent Denial, and it says, Your tendency is admirable and futile, Emperor Abishan. And there you go, guys, and that is the entire video, and I hope you guys have a good day and a good evening. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Ruin Snow, and today we're going to be talking about Let's Talk Legendary, and today we're going to be talking about the god, Alron, the god of cosmos. So Alron is the god of cosmos and the wisdom from the plane called Haim. On occasion, he disguises himself as Azzy, who is a human. Alron is most of the time depicted as an old man with a gray beard and an eye patch. His raven, Haka, flies throughout the realm to collect knowledge for Alron. Alron's mood actually affects how he acts. For example, if he is very happy, he would be a great company as he would be put on a great feast and tell stories. But when he was in, like, say, a pondering mood, he would often talk in riddles. Alron was born wise and wanted to learn everything there was to be. So when he decided, when he was young, he was going to submit all the cosmos monsters so he can learn all the secrets of the knowledge they had. This, of course, took centuries. Eventually, the quest was complete and he still wanted to learn more as called Heem still held secrets. But during this quest, he found a baby boy in an eagle's nest on Axgard. Alron took him in and named him Halvar. Because as he was still on his quest, he left Havilar with the Dwarf King for 20 years and then returned. 
Alrun also lived with Kazuma together in the God's Hall and had three children, Bergi, Toralf, and Culvery. Alrun also had a brother named Jorn. When Alrun turned into his human form Azzy, he joined Kea and Igna Ruin Eyes to hunt a monster named Vorinclex. Vorinclex was a new Phyrexian Praetor. All three met up with Vorinclex in Aldergard. Vorinclex almost defeated actually all three of them, except that that moment Azzy turned into himself, Alrun, using his magic. After placing a magical barrier, Vorinclex left Bretgard, and Kea started to follow him eventually. After all this, he instructed everyone, including Tyvar, Kea, and the human leader, to give Havlar the Sword of the Realms. This is so Havlar can end Doomscar, and Doomscar was actually involved with Tabalt. So that is currently all the information we have Alrun at the moment, and let's begin with what he is represented in. So you've seen the card he's represented in this card. You see Alrun, God of Cosmos, three colors and two blue, and it says it gets plus one, plus one for each card in your hand and each foretold card you own in exile. At the beginning of your end step, choose a card, choose a type. Then reveal the top two cards of your library, put all cards of the chosen type into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So there's one card that Alrun is associated with, which is really cool, I actually like this card, it's uh, Alrun's Amphitheny, it costs 5 colors and 2 islands, it says create 2 one, one bird creature tokens with flying, take an extra turn after this one, exile the card from. Very cool, and the foretell is 4 colors and 2 islands. The next card that Alrun is associated with is of course Hakka, the Whispering Raven. It costs one color, so two, one blue, and it's a 2-3. So whenever Hakka Whispering Raven deals combat damage to a player, return it to its owner's hands, then scry two. So that's really cool. And it says, all runs Raven soars between realms. No secret is beyond his grasp. And the last card is actually depicted in a strategic planet with one color and one island. And it says, look at the top three cards of your library and put one of them into your hand and the rest into your grave. I guess it goes with the storyline where he wants to acquire knowledge. And the saying says, all runs sees the future as the whole of signs and symbols, omens interwoven in an intricate knotwork only he can decipher. And that's it guys, so I hope you guys have a good day and a good evening, and if you like this video, there's more on the channel. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Runestone, today we're going to do Let's Talk Legendary, and we're going to be talking about Athros, the God of Passage. So, as we said, we're going to be talking about Athros is the God of Passage of Theros. Basically, he's a similar to the Greek god, and Theros is the plane, again, similar to the Greek era. Like any god with his role, his job is to make it easy for the passage of the life to death. He's the divine ferryman for the underworld, rivers of the ring of world, as they're called, a subterranean realm where the dead eventually end up. It is a boundary between Theros and its underworld. Athros is always has his staff waiting for the dead, as is typically seen with his tattered clothes, as you can see in some cards. The staff that he's used to create a boat on the water where he takes down one of the five rivers. Each river goes to a different place, depends on the type of life the person has lived. If there are souls that stray from this path, actually, he will send skeletal griffins to bring them back. Pretty crazy. In Theros, typically a uh, clay mask is put on a uh, newly departed so that Athros can make sure which river the person is actually supposed to follow. These masks apparently can be broken and used as barter in the underworld. So that's actually much of all the information about Athros, the god of passage. He's actually seen in many cards and quoted and referred to in many cards. The first card, as you see, he is seen as Athros, the god of passage. It's an indestructible card for three mana, which is really cool. As long as your devotion is white and black, is less than seven, Athros is in a creature. Whenever another creature you own dies, return it to your hand unless the target opponent pays three life. And the next card, as you can see, is Athros Shout Veiled, as you can see with his tattered clothes and his staff waiting. And it's another indestructible card, and it says, As long as your devotion to white and black is less than seven, he isn't a creature. At the beginning of your end step, put a coin counter on another target creature. Whenever a creature with a coin counter on it dies, put it into exile. Return that card to the battlefield under your control. That's very cool. It's a 4-7 for 6 mana. Very impressive. There are actually two cards that Athros is associated with, as you can see with this one, his Kunros, Hound of Athreos. And the saying is, three sharp barks announce an attempt to escape the underworld. Their sharp bites end it. Again, with going with Greek mythology, this is very close to similar. 
It's a legendary creature and it is a hound, which vigilant, menace, and lifelike creatures in graveyards can't enter the battlefield. Again, going with the Greek mythology, this is very ironic. I like that card because they can't come out of the underworld. Players can't cast spells from graveyards. It's really cool. It's a 3 for a 3 3. A very impressive card. The next card that's associated with him is. And as you can see, there is no text or anything with it, the Temple of Silence. But you can see there is a boat ready for the ferry taking them down to the rivers of the Ring of the World. So basically that is a picture of the boat ready for them to go, and that is why it is associated. Next is we have cards that he's quoted or referred to, and the first one on the list is Agus of the Gods. And in the saying on the blow, it says, Atheros cares little for other gods conflict with mortals he's concerned only with a safe passage for the dead again that is his job and can't go wrong with that right and the next card we have is grim guardian and it says occasionally by the living wonder to the rivers but the wardens of atheros ensure that only the dead pass again that's really ironic I mean, if you know anything about the storyline as well as with greek mythology that saying is perfect the next card is very uh, unparticular it is the scholar of atheros and she asks pointed questions of the dead who awaited for Athros, learning of life from those who are about to leave it. So it's really cool. She wants to know, and as you can see in the background, there is the Temple of Silence. So this is a very cool card. It is a Scholar of Athros. Three white for that one four. Very cool card. And the next card that he's associated with, which is really cool, as we mentioned before, is the Sentry of the Underworld. Those are the griffins that he sends out for those people that go away. And it says in the bottom, when Atheros gathers the newly dead to the be ferried across the five rivers, that ring of that world, he sends skeletal griffins to fetch those who stray, as mentioned before. And I really like the picture. Again, they keep the magic the gathering. They're keeping the whole story together with these few cards. It's really cool. Let's move on to the next card. And the last card on our list is actually a blue card. It's called Thassa's Ear. And the saying says, The sailor had never seen a god before. Now she had gained upon Thassa. Shortly, she would see Athros, and then she would meet Erebos. <laughs> Again, we go with the Greek mythology. It's pretty cool. It's just, it's just, you see three gods in that saying. I don't know. I thought it was pretty funny. I'm really glad they threw this card in that. So if you like this video, I hope you guys have a good day and a good evening. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Runesto, and today we're going to be doing Let's Talk Legendary. And today we're talking about Bergi, the god of storytelling. So today we're going to be talking about god of storytelling, Bergi, but unfortunately there's not a lot of information on this god. We do know that Bergi is from Caledonium. She is apparently a fun-loving, charismatic god. She is always the center of attention and she travels across all of the ten realms. Nico Eris was a planeswalker who once arrived on Caledonium. Nico Eris encountered some of the Viking clans who sh showed him the ways. Of course, Bergi was the one that convinced the clans to do this. So Bergi is actually only in two cards represented, as you can see, Bergi, God of Storytelling, and Harnfell, Horn of the Bounty. So I'd like to thank everyone for watching, and I hope you guys have a good day and a good evening. And if you do enjoy this video, there are more videos on this channel. And don't forget to hit that subscribe. Thank you, and have a good day. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Rune, so we're going to be doing Let's Talk Legendary. Today, we'll be doing Cosma, the God of Voyage. So Cosma is actually a god from the plane Kaldeheim. And she actually has a hard time staying in one place at a time. She's actually different from the rest of the Scotty as she was born a Cosmos monster. She's actually a great dolphin who swam on the auroras between all the realms and took the form of a human when entered the god's realm. She proclaimed herself the daughter of the sea. She does not live with the rest of the gods but is welcomed any time as she likes. When she enters the water, she actually turns back into a dolphin again, and the people suspect that she spends most of her time in Litjara. Cosma owns a boat called the Omukil, where it can take passengers anywhere on the town realms. She is almost in every pair that the omen seekers make while they're at sea. Cosma and Alrun had three children, actually, one named Bergi, Torav, and Kovari. She stayed with the children at uh, God's Hall for at least 20 years. But believe it or not, Cosma had actually met the planeswalker Kerry who wanted to use her boat to find the Vornklex, but actually ended up in Nutvold. And that's all the information we have on her right now. So let's begin with the cards that she's represented, associated, and quoted or referred to. As you've seen the card throughout the whole video, she's represented in this card that you see. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, you may exile Cosmo. If you do, it gains whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control. If it is exiled, you may put a voyage counter on it. If you don't, 
return it to the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it and draw X cards where X is the number of Voyager counters on it. So if you just flip the card, she's associated with the Omen Keel, which is her ship, and it says whenever a vehicle you control deals combat damage to a player, that player exiles that many cards from the top of their library. You may play lands from among those cards as long as they remain exiled with a crew of one. Very cool. So in this card, Cosmo is actually referred to, and if you look at the saying, it says the Scald boasted that he could out sting the sea. Cosmo had heard him and drowned his village with a single wave, and in the picture it's pretty very impressive. Longbeard Sega. And the last card that she's represented is in Run Ashore, and the saying goes, which one of your slug brain milk tops forgot to make an offering to Cosmo? Joker Navigator, and if you look at the picture, the ship's about to run ashore, get it? Anyway, I thought it was really cool. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope you have a good day and a good evening. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Runestone, and today we'll be talking about Egon, the God of Death. So Egon, the God of Death, is actually the, from Caladium. He's uh, different from the rest of the Skeladi, which are the gods, where he actually ages backwards. Egon is also one of the oldest Skadi. As a result of the aging backwards, Egon looks like a teenage boy, who even sometimes has that attitude of one as well. So Egon is uh, basically ruler of the realm Itzfel. He can make the spirits do anything in that area because they have apathy toward him. And unfortunately, that is all the information at this time we have on Egon, the god of death. So Egon, the death is actually represented in one card. As you can see, as you've seen throughout the video, Egon, god of death, was caught two colors and a swamp, and it has death touch. And it says at the beginning of your RP, Exile the two cards from your graveyard. If you can't, sacrifice Egon and draw a card. And the saying goes, Egon ages backwards. His wisdom soured by the youthful spite. So Egon is actually associated with one card in the series. And it's the Throne of Death, which is the flip. And it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, mill a card. Two colors in a swamp. Exile a creature card from your graveyard and draw a card. Could be very good, could be very bad. Costs only one mana. So Egon the Death is actually quoted or referred to in two cards. The first one as known as Narfi, the betrayer of the king, and it says on the bottom, to serve the god of death, Narfi forfeited the warmth of life. And the last card that he's quoted or referred to is in Weather Crown, and it says, we'll see each other again soon, Egon of death. Really good card, really cool saying. So that is all the cards that we have related or associated to Egon of the death, and I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you guys have a good day and a good evening.